Yeah. Hello and welcome everybody. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much Stefan for inviting me and also for Nuno for coordinating all of this. Yeah, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to present Henshin, a graph-based model transformation whose development I'm leading, but there's of course many collaborators involved with this. So this presentation, uh, this uh, training session is based on materials that were developed, developed together with Alex Uruzo, Stefan Jon and Stefan. First, a few words for motivation. So we are here in this MDE net context. So I guess everybody of you has some idea of what model driven engineering is. For me, model driven engineering is lots about transformations. Of course, we have models. Models come in all different shapes and sizes and all different abstraction levels. So you might start on a high level by having some kind of an analysis model, which is not really detailed yet. Then the typical process is you do some forward engineering to come to a more detailed model, like a design model. Eventually, you do some code generation. And code could also see, be seen as some kind of model, so based on some meta model for code that exists, right? You can always go back, for example, using reverse engineering techniques, and you can also do some in-place transformation. So, for example, you can also refactor your models, you can optimize your models, and you might also want to derive some formal models you can use for certain validation techniques, like, for example, model checking. So, in all of these red arrows are transformations, so two main kinds of transformations, models, model transformations where we stay in the same language, so these in-place transformations like refactorings, but also outplace and exogenous transformations where we change the language, for example, by going from design model to source code. And yeah, so in that sense, MDE is lots about transformation. Yeah, and people have developed all kinds of different languages for supporting transformations, and Henshin is one of them with a certain focus. So uh, the goal of Henshin is really to offer an intuitive model transformation language that supports a graphical syntax. So there's a couple of benefits that come from that. So you have a nice and easy way to see how your transformations uh, look like, uh, what kind of modifications they do to your models. And it's also intuitive in a way. You could even show these figures to people who are not that familiar with coding, but they like the graphical syntax. It's meant to support various kinds of transformations. So in particular, in-place transformations, and uh, endogenous transformations, but we can also we will also see how it supports exogenous transformations between different languages. And there's also rich theory behind it. So that theory of ground transformations, in particular the double push-out approach that goes back to the 70s. So it's nice that it's formal because it allows us also to have some kinds of uh, formally supported ways of analyzing things. So we can make some guarantees, we can give some statements about the quality of your transformations that are based on formal guarantees. The paradigm is rule-based, so we express the kinds of changes we want to do using rules. Like for example, with this transformation here, where we go from a um, from some kind of transformer that looks more like a truck to something that looks more like a, a humanoid uh, transformer. Uh, we express this as a rule. So there's a left-hand side and a right-hand side, and the left-hand side describes what is and what you want to match, and the right-hand side describes uh, what you want to have instead. And so rules are the one main concept, but we might also use some additional concepts because rules alone are not always sufficient for expressing all the changes we want to, but that we will see later. Yeah, just the word on the background of Henshin and the name in particular, so it's a Japanese word for transformation. So if you ever wondered what Henshin means, that's what it is. So what's the agenda for today? So I will give you a guided tour. It's supposed to be interactive, so there will also be some exercises. It includes some tryout parts. That's not something that we will do in this session that you also will install this yourself and you do demos, but you uh, can try it out using the instructions that I provided. So in the chat, you will find the link where you can download the required environment, where you can download some slide material with instructions and also some examples that you can try out. And then we will um, yeah, first look at the language. We will look at that tryout part of using engine. We will look at some advanced features and also of applications of Henshin. And then we will look at one particular application in search-based model optimization. So in that particular kind of transformation where we want to optimize a given model, this is a, a use case in which Henshin has proven itself as very useful. So we will go into some background of that use case. We will look at one solution based on MD Optimizer, a tool that builds on Henshin. And then we will see one particular case the class responsibility assignment case that again also includes the tryout part. 
Okay, a guided tour. So I spent some time in London together with uh, Steffen. I got inspired to yeah, use the tube as a metaphor that we will yeah, follow today. So we will follow the ancient line, starting at the language, which has an intersection with the graph information line in the uh, language stop. Then we will move on to the interaction part, then to features, and then also have applications where we have an intersection with the optimization line. So how does the language of Henshin look like? I want to introduce the language in a running example. So in the context of banking, it's about specifying certain processes in a bank and to analyze them and to simulate them. So I want to specify four particular processes, the creation of an account, the transfer of money, the deletion of an account, and also the batch deletion of several accounts. The models in this scenario might look like this. So data-driven models that we have concrete banks, concrete managers, concrete customers, and concrete accounts. And all of this also has an underlying meta model. So in this talk, I assume that you have some familiarity with EMF. Essentially, we have a meta model that is the basis for creating example models like that one. So we have banks that have managers, that have accounts, and that also, sorry for that, and that also have clients. A manager and clients are both persons that have a name and uh, accounts have an owner. Okay, let's have a look at the very first example rule for this. So this is for the creation of new accounts. Now we will now we see here how rules look like in Henshin. They look as follows. So essentially we have a graph in which we have nodes and edges. And all nodes and edges have also some action. Like in particular, the action that we want to preserve certain elements, like a bank, a manager, and a client. Those things are not really changed when we create new accounts, but we have to specify them as context. The context that we use to create new elements, like for example, accounts. And we also specify certain parts that are forbidden. So for example, when we want to specify the creation of an account, we want to make sure that the ID that we specify for a new account is unique. In this case, we will then also forbid existing accounts with the same account ID that we provide as input parameter here. And we have one more input parameter, which is the name of the client. And then, yeah, so in this particular example, we have three actions. We have preserve elements, we have create elements, and we have forbid elements. But there's more. We also want to delete elements sometimes. We want to require additional elements, and we also might want to have kind of different kinds of parameters. Here we have input parameters, so the client name and the account name go into the rule, but we also might want to have out parameters in case we want to propagate the information from the rule somewhere else. We could have in out parameters in case we want to feed something into the rule, change it and pass it somewhere else. And then it's also variables, which we'll look into later. So what do we do with these rules? Assume we have that rule, and we also have an input model. So this small input model, we have one bank with the manager Frank, with the clients Anne and Bill, and with a certain account with an account number. And now we want to create a new account using that rule. So given that the rule has two parameters called client and account ID, we have to specify the value for these parameters. So the client name would be Bill in that case, and the account name would be and the account ID would be 0539. So what do you expect when you apply that rule? Uh, it's not rocket science in that case. So we assume that when we apply this rule to this model, we will have something like this. We have a new account that is linked to the customer bill, which was identified using its name. And we also have that account ID it was specified with the rule. Okay, um, you saw already the uh, tricky part of this particular replication. So uh, here we would have a similar replication where we have almost the same parameters. So we have the client bill, but in this case we use the account ID 0538. And here we see that in the input model, there is already an account with the number 0538. So in that case, 
yeah, there is not really an output model. There is no root application possible. So this is so-called negative application condition specified by these forbid elements here that governs under which conditions we can applica, applica, apply this particular rule. Okay, one more example where we don't really change the structure of the graph, so don't, we don't create all these elements, but we work with attributes. In this case, the attribute would be the uh, credit that particular customers have on their accounts. So we want to transfer money. The signature of this rule is that we have an, a given client, we have a from ID, we have a to ID, so two different accounts are involved. We have an amount that we want to transfer, and then we also have two variables, X and Y. These variables here are used so that we can calculate the changed value of the credit on the account. So that means the following, we have this calculation where we say that um, the account that we take the money from start with the value X, but we will change the value so it becomes X minus amount. So these are expressions here, right? So we go from one expression to another expression, and uh, we do the same also on the receiving end. So here we have that variable y, and we set the value of the variable y to an expression y plus amount. And also we have some conditions. So we can require that the amount is positive. Obviously, we want to avoid some uh, nasty people stealing our money. Uh, so we say that the transfer has to can only work if we have a positive amount of money. And it, it, also um, the uh, transaction should be covered. So we only, we only allow transactions if the uh, credit that we have on the account uh, is at least the amount that we want to transfer. Okay, these were some additional concepts. Yeah, these expressions, like for example, X minus amount, are actually JavaScript expressions here. So we get the full explicitness of JavaScript. Okay, what happens now if we apply this particular rule to this input model? So we have two clients, Anne and Bill. Anne has an account with 50 credits, and Bill has a client, an account with 30 credits. And we now have these parameters. So the client N, we have these account IDs, and we have the amount of 10. So what would we expect as the output here? 50 minus 10 should be 40. 30 plus 10 should be 42. So this is what we expect. And that's also what you would get intention actually. Okay, doing that we have another amount here, minus 30. Somebody tries to steal money. We don't allow that. So given this condition here, which is not fulfilled, that the amount has to be positive, no rule application with these particular parameters would be possible. Okay, one more. Uh, so we want to be able to delete accounts. One first way of doing this would be as follows. We say that we specify the ID of the account that we want to delete as an input parameter. And then we just say, okay, we have that node and it's supposed to be deleted. Yeah, is this really, really sufficient? The way that I phrased this uh, question indicates there's some something that could go wrong with that. So assuming that we have this input model where we have uh, uh, this account and we want to delete it, that doesn't really work, right? So because when we delete elements, like for example, the account, then uh, the element might be connected to other elements. In this case, the account is connected to the bank, to the client N. And by deleting this element, we would leave behind some dangling edges so Henshin ensures this won't happen. This is the default behavior. That's also ways of deactivating that kind of check. In that case, there's a default way of uh, uh, ensuring that uh, dangling edges will also be removed. But by default, because we want to be safe, we ensure that, that these kinds of deletions will not happen. And then in this case, you would not be able to apply the rule. So what do you want instead? So you want to specify the complete pattern for the deletion, which includes deleting the account, but also deleting all, uh, all references, either incoming or outgoing references that connect this element to anything else. 
in this case, the bank that contains the account and also any customer that is connected to account by being its owner. So when you delete a model element, a model element you need to specify all references from and to that element as needed to. This is the so-called dangling condition. Okay, finally, something advanced. Sometimes you want to do something uh, in a way that applies to all elements to which something applies. So we want to have some kind of a for all operator. Similar to in programming languages, when you have four loops, where you do something uh, for each value of a particular list or an array. So for each loop, more to say, we have this for all operator, where we want to, for example, say that we want to delete all accounts. It looks like this, so we have the special graphical representation, which looks like two nested accounts, and the asterisks, the star, indicates to us this is really a multi-node, how we call it. So the whole pattern here then leads to a so-called multi-rule, and that has a certain semantics. So now by having these multi-elements, uh, the overall rule consists of a kernel, which are the non-multi-parts, and a multi-rule, which are the multi-parts. And the semantics of this is that we apply the kernel rule only once, and then we apply the multi-rule as often as possible at that given place, which was identified by the first part in the input model. So what would an application of this rule look like? Let's say that we want to apply this rule, where we delete all accounts, and we also specify the name of the client as George. Here we had George with two accounts, and the output would look like this. No surprises here, we just remove all accounts with their connecting edges. Another example where we want to apply this rule, where we have a client called Hank, and Hank doesn't really have any accounts, what would happen? What do you expect? I can tell you, so we will be able to execute the rule and it will not do anything. So based on the semantics that we talked about here, we apply the kernel rule once. In this case, the kernel rule doesn't do anything. It just matches, but it doesn't really change anything. And then the multi-rule as often as possible, which might also include to execute it only once, or only um, zero times. So. Applying that multiple zero times leads to not doing any changes in this count case, not deleting any accounts. Okay, I hope that these examples were enough to give you some flavor of what the language of engine looks like. It's also an underlying meta model. So just uh, for those of you who like to understand how the language is really defined, this meta model includes rules and yeah that come, might come as a surprise for you that the left hand side and right hand side here are made explicit so we have two different graphs even though the language itself looks like it only has one graph right we have that we have those preserved elements that lead elements and they all seem to be in the same graph but the visual syntax of Henshin yeah, abstracts away from that a little bit so we have no actions here in this particular meta model but uh, whether an element is deleted or not depends on whether it's contained in the left-hand side. Whether it's to be created depends on whether it's contained in the right-hand side. And we also have preserved elements. For those, we have those mappings here. So you will see that mappings are between different nodes of a rule, of a, of a graph. So rules have mappings. Mappings have an origin and an image. And we can map elements from left-hand side to right-hand side graphs. And when we have two elements in the left and right-hand side, and we want to mark them as being the same, which means that they are preserved, then we would use this mapping to ensure that. So then we would have a mapping between the left-hand side, so the origin node would be in the left-hand side and the image node in the right-hand side. Then we have some advanced stuff. So these formulas here, so the these are really for specifying these application conditions. 
Like we saw already the negative application condition, where we want to, to say that we don't want to allow replications if it would lead to the creation of an account whose ID is already in use. But you can also have pull application conditions, and you can even nest them using Boolean formulas. So you can say if you, so if you want to apply that rule, then we should not be able to match that pattern and also be able to map that pattern and also and then something nested, like for example, this pattern and this pattern and this pattern. And also, of course, OS, so you see all kinds of Boolean combinations between application conditions are possible. And then finally, we also saw this advanced idea of multi rules. So, this for all operator that's supported by allowing rules to contain other rules, where the outer rule in this case, so the rule higher in the hierarchy, would be the kernel rule. And then lower level rules are multi rules. And multi rules can also have uh, nested multi rules. So, this nesting level can be arbitrarily deep. So, you can also have something like nested for each loop in that sense. Okay, so well, how do instances of that meta model look like? So it's the same rule we saw before, the creation of new accounts, but this time we see it in EMF's tree based editor, where we see how the left hand side and the right hand side actually look like. So you see we have note, notes for banks, for clients, for managers, and the same in the right hand side. So these are the preserved elements that provide the context for the creation. And we have these mappings here to mark really that banks on the left hand side and right hand side are the same elements and so on. And we also have this negative application condition here where we say that we don't really want to have another account with the same account number. So this is a small graph that contains the bank node and the account node. And then that blue part here, the forbid uh, node and edge they together specify the negative pattern that is not supposed to exist already. Yeah. To wrap up, so we have these deleted and preserved elements on the left-hand side. We have those created and preserved elements on the right-hand side. And we have mappings between left-hand side and right-hand side to mark elements as being preserved. And then we also have negative, in this example, application conditions. Now we want to go one step further. What we have seen so far are rules and uh, the expressiveness you get with rules. So this is fine and nice for really simple kinds of changes, but sometimes you want to have a little bit more. You want to write a whole program that consists of rules. And uh, to make this clear in an example, so let's say the task is to build a sparse grid, like this grid here. So it means that we, uh, yeah, we always have so we have like a pattern that looks like something um, you know, that consists of many squares. We see that we have always um, five different rows and then two columns and then an empty column, so to say. So it's a pattern you want to create. And if you want, if you want to create a pattern like this with rules, it could look like this. So we start out by first creating a grid that would be empty in the beginning. Then we start the first column. So for this, we create two nodes. So these top nodes and also then the two next nodes. So this node and this node together would be the start of the grid. And then we want to extend the columns an arbitrary number of times. So for this, we would apply this rule extend column an arbitrary number of times where we just create some pair of nodes for a given pair of nodes. And yeah, one particular notation you see here is this add grid notation, which says uh, we assume that there is a container node. So this grid would be the container node. And for all elements that are created, they will be automatically put into this container node. Okay, so these rules are the building blocks that we can use for building a sparse grid like that, but that's not really everything yet. We have to orchestrate the rules. Daniel, uh -huh. can you see the chart at all? Oh, I cannot see the chat. Sorry for that. Yeah. Let me uh, see. Uh, because, because there, I think there's been a question here, and some people have been responding to your questions on the oh, chat. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry for I'm, that. I will I'm I'm that I will get some automated little navigation. Yeah. Would it be enough to just create two nodes in start column? 
that would also be enough, right? So when you would only have, if you had only these two first nodes, then um, that would allow you also to have um, a version of that sparse grid that only has these two first nodes. You could argue whether that's really a grid then. It doesn't really look so much like a grid then at this point. Yeah, but it would also be a possible way, especially if you have additional rows to extend in that way. Yeah, so that would work. Other question, you, don't you also need NUC to stop lots of rows attached to the same upper row? Yeah, that's a very really good point. And that's actually something we addressed by uh, this particular construct here. So NUX would be one way of enabling that. But the way that we do it here is using these units. So to, to um, use the control flow to ensure that we don't continue forever, so to say. Let me just recheck if I answered the right question. So if I ask, if I have to say the right question, the right, the right answer for the question, you also need to not to stop lots of rows attached to the same upper row. Right, so your control right, right, flow yeah, is going to control... It. Sorry. Yeah. So, so it sounds as though your control flow is actually going to control when models are consistent and exactly. not just yeah. efficiently exactly. how to get them built. Yeah, yeah. I think it's we're going yeah. exactly where we're going. So it's both the control flow and it's also that we make explicit where we are currently. So we have these pointers, yeah. this next pointer here. You see that this is a parameter that we first start out by having out as the uh, having grid as the output parameter of the first rule. Then when we when we do start column, we say that next is the out parameter of that rule. So we keep oh. track of which node we have. And then okay. later when we do extend column, we use this as the input parameter. And oh, I see. Output. Yeah, so actually you Excellent. see that trends are going on, right? We go from this uh, to next in the beginning here is that node. And then we make it that node next step. I hope you can see that. Because that would be, yeah. Right. That's a good point. Yeah, yes, no deal orchestration for the question of how do we ensure that we actually execute the right rules for the right number of times and in the right order. That's really what units are for. So again, the same rules as before. And now we also have these different units. They look like small uh, state chart diagrams. Technically, they are, I would say. So you have states, so to say, which are the rules. And the overall um, program would be this build grid, build grid unit, which does nothing else except for just calling init grid. So that first rule, it creates the grid. And then also build columns, which is another unit. And build columns is actually an iterated unit, which means that we do the inner unit here a certain number of times. And that number of times comes from the input parameters, in this case, the width and the half of the grid. So these parameters are passed on here. And then we do this, this creation of columns a certain number of times, which is the width divided by two. Create column, what does this do? This uh, is another unit, a sequential unit, where we do first start column and then expand column. Uh, start column was this rule and then expand column. Uh, extend column was this rule. Uh, expand column is also another unit, so it's this unit, which is again iterated. So we do extend column, which is the rule extend column, a certain number of times, which is in this case the height minus two. All that here. Just to show you the meta model for that also. So we now have this concept of units. And rules are also units here. So this allows us to do this nesting here, where we say we, for example, call also rules as part of a unit. Inner units of units are just units, and those can in particular be rules. So the rule is a unit. And then we have other types of units, which are, for example, multi-unit, like that sequential unit where we just execute units in a certain order, independent unit where we have an arbitrary selection, so we want to have some randomness, so we just say we pick one rule arbitrarily. We have priority units, which are a bit like priority queues, so you first try to execute the first unit. If that works out, then use that one, otherwise you take the second one, and so on. Then we have conditional units, where we also can specify the condition under which the set unit is executed. And we also have unary units, where we 
Yeah, only have one subunit that we can either execute a certain number of times. So iterated unit would be uh, this particular unit where we have an iteration parameter, it is an expression, or we have loop unit, which just means we do it as long as it's possible, which assumes there should be some kind of way to stop, otherwise it will just go on forever. So there could, for example, be some negative application condition that makes the units eventually stop. Or we just take away stuff until everything is left. So that would be some ways of unit using these loop units. Okay, so far we have seen endogenous transformations. Transformations where we stay inside the same language, where we update an existing model in that language. But sometimes you also want to have accidental transformations. So this example is slightly overused, going from uh, meta models to relation, relational database schema. So I think 10 years ago there were already tweets that <laughs> were complaining about overuse of this example. Yeah, but we use it here too, just to illustrate how it works out in Henshin. In particular, interesting is here that we have that nesting of multi-rules. So we want to uh, we want to transform a particular package into a schema. And we do this by uh, assuming this package is given, so it's preserved. We want to delete a new schema, so it's a create node. And then we also create traces. So it's something that you get for free in languages that are really designed for this kind of uh, bidirectional transformations. Here in this case, we just have an additional meta model, a trace meta model, which allows us to have traces which uh, yeah, map to sources and targets. So this is the top rule here, the kernel rule, where we just create one schema for a given package. But then we also have a first level multi rule where we create for each class from our package one particular uh, table in the schema. And the table and also has a certain number of columns. So that's another multi rule here that uh, depends on PK, uh, PK. So this is something that here would be assumed that we have some particular uh, attribute which is identified as being the primary key attribute. For that, we create that column here. That's what has been going on. You see that so we have uh, classes which have attributes, and every attribute becomes one column in a table. So in that sense, it's a rule where we have uh, a kernel rule and then two levels of multi rule nesting. Yeah, so that could be seen as a mega model here. So the big picture of Henshin, we assume that we have some given source meta model, a target meta model. Both are specified using ECOR. And we want to specify transformation between the two. So there's also a transformation meta model, which I showed you before, whose instances become concrete transformations so that we can use an existing source model and apply that transformation specification to create an output target model. Okay, so much for the language. Now let's do something uh, slightly more hands-on. So let's see Hedgen in action. So yeah, and these are some really concrete instructions in case you want to try this out on your own computer. Uh, for time reasons, we will just do it together now on my computer. So these steps are that we will import a project, we will look at some rules, and then we will execute the rules in two ways. And then, yeah, as a homework exercise, you can also roll your own rule by creating conditional rules for new uh, requirements. So let's switch to Eclipse. So here in this case, I already prepared something, but I can just as well delete it. So the importing here of this example looks like it always works in Eclipse. We just assume this, oh, I should maybe use this right import function for this existing product into a workspace. So there's an archive file somewhere that in this case doesn't contain any projects yet. Yes, actually it does. So that project all catch and bank we will import now. What do we have here? So a couple of different things. Most of all, we have the graphical representation of our Henshin rules. It looks a little bit messy. This is due to versioning uh, questions. So when you go between different Eclipse versions, sometimes things slightly change, but you will still see when you do some slight relayouting, it's really the particular rules that we already saw on the previous slides. 
and now we can execute them also. So that's how it looks like. You can also create new rules. It's full. Like for example, the creation of a new manager. Within a certain bank. Yeah, so this is how you edit in Henshin, and you have this graphical view, and there's also an underlying uh, Henshin file, which is then just the aspect syntax version of that model. So it's only in a tree based view, it looks like this. So we have, for example, our new manager creation rule do something useful. Which includes that node and then also corresponding right hand side nodes and also these two be created nodes and edges. Okay, and we also have our example instance. So we have uh, the example bank, which for example has a manager John and clients Alice, Bob, and Charles, and we have these four accounts here. So what is something you would like to do now? I guess something you would like to do is we need to apply the rules, right? So how does that work? We will first see the first way of doing that. And for this, we have that wizard. So this is really the most simple way where you don't need to write any code. You just take an existing model, like for, for example, this model here, example bank. And we also have this, uh, you know, this bank.hension file, the engine file that we right clicked on, and we can now also change, uh, select a particular account you want to create. And we have this here, and we also want to create a new account, so we will need to have some unique ID which has not been used yet. So that's what we specify here in this parameter setting menu. And now what we get, hopefully, is a changed version of that model. Yeah, that seems to have worked out. So now we see this comparison view where we can see what has been changed. So you see there's a right and a left hand side here. And uh, due to some circumstances that go back to how uh, EMS compare works, in that case, you would see the old version of the model right and the new version left. So we see in particular that this old version of the model did not have count 5555, uh, while the new version does. And you can also see the concrete changes in this listing here. You see that there was a change to the client Alice, which was to add this accounts edge. And there's also a newly created account, which also connects to this accounts edge that uh, yeah, leads to client Alice. And you also see that the result of the transformation has been automatically stored to the file system. So we see now there has been a new account being created with that account number. And we see also client Alice. If we look at her accounts in the properties view, then, she, then we see she has two accounts, which are one and five, 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 five. Okay, that seems to have worked out. That's a step in case you want to do it for yourself later. You can use this slide deck as a reference. So everything I've done now is described in a slide deck. Yeah, so the next step would be, yeah, it's it's nice that we can execute those rules using a wizard, using a graphical interface. So this is nice for doing some really quick checks if the rules work out like they should. But maybe uh, in the long term, uh, that might not really be what you want because you often want to use the rules from somewhere else, or to the units you want to use it from somewhere else. Like for example, when you develop something on top of Henshin, like you develop a refactoring tool, which refactorings are specified using Henshin, but you apply it to some uh, program automatically, then of course it doesn't really work with the you know, UI in which users have to select the rules and have to automatically uh, have to manually specify parameters. So what we need here is really some kind of API, right? And we also have that. So we have an API which allows us to automatically execute Henshin transformations by applying the rules to a given example. So this is just a very uh, brief view of what the essential kinds of commands look like. So first we have something which is called Henshin resource set. It's an extension of the resource sets you might know from EMF, which is just wired in a certain way, which makes it easier for Henshin 
to process the, the contents in it. And then we load a module. So module is just a container of many rules and units. In this case, here the bank attention file would be the module with all of the bank transactions. Then we want uh, the example model to which we will apply the rules. In this case here, we use uh, the get resource function to load the example XMI file from your file system, and then we store it in a data structure which is called an eGraph. So this is some yeah, aspect of engine. It has this interpreter. So we have an engine that allows you to execute rules to a given uh, example graph. And that really takes this eGraph as a structure to wrap around. So then the engine will be created here. So we create a new engine. And that engine will be used for creating a unit application. And the unit application takes both the example graph, so the graph that we created by loading this resource from the file system. And then we also uh, need the unit we want to execute. So in this case, we would have the create account unit and we would set the parameter values of Alice to client, uh, of client to Alice, and of account ID to five. So these are key value pairs in which the keys are the names of the particular parameters and the values are the values of the parameters. And then finally, we do the execution. So this is a pass fail kind of thing, right? Either we execute correctly, then we will just move on to the next line. Or there might be an error. In that case, yeah, the debugging here is a bit rudimentary, like a bit uh, uh, really simple. The only thing you can see is really it hasn't worked out and it gives you this message, error creating account for Alice. So we actually also have some a bit more advanced support for debugging. Um, yeah, often you also end up just doing some Java based uh, debugging. So you need to have some understanding of how the um, Beta model looks like that helps you really to understand how to debug these things in Java, but hopefully you don't need to debug a lot. Okay, now as an exercise, something you could do is implement those new rules. So pay a long time bonus, add $10 to an account whose ID is lower than five, and also fire unproductive manager, delete from a given bank manager who is not assigned to any customers. And here are some hints for that. So to create a parameter or variable in the rule, double click the rule's title bar and change the list after the rule name. So what this means is when you are in the editor, you need to have some way of changing the parameters. Yeah, and this is done in a really lightweight way here in this editor. We can just double click or do F2 on the title bar. I did just the F2 thing, but it should also work by double clicking which used to work in the past, but apparently not anymore. So sorry for that. Then it's F2, so the default uh, button you press when you want to change names is F2 in Eclipse. And here it works the same, so we say something useful. And then we can change the list of parameters by saying, for example, we want to create a manager with the name. Uh, uh, the name parameter would be name in this case. So it can look like this. And then we say for the manager, there's an attribute here. So the name attribute is name. So, that is okay here. It doesn't confuse engine that you have uh, an attribute with the name name, and that also takes the parameter with the name name. That just works out like that. Yeah. So, yeah. for time reasons, I, su I suggest that we uh, just skip this particular task. But if you have any questions, so if maybe you have, you have something in your mind, which uh, of, how, of how you would do it. Um, if not, uh, or if you have no idea how to do it, and you can also ask the question now in the chat, then we can maybe look at two together. And I see there's also lots of stuff going on in the chat. The infamous O2DB example. Is there so, so I will now answer all the questions I saw in the chat. Is there some support for modularity in the rule? Just wondering if the graph pattern could grow to be very large and a bit difficult to see in one screen useful. Yeah, so we don't have inheritance enhancement. Sometimes you can benefit from having inheritance in the underlying meta model, right? Like if there are different uh, subclasses of a certain class, then you only need to have one rule that then covers all of the different subclasses. That works sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't really work. For other cases, um, 
you might need to repeat yourself a bit. What we do have is a support for variants. So if you have a couple of rules that are all very similar, but that have some differences, then you can specify so-called presence conditions. It's similar to ifs or if devs also in, in the case of C. So you can say that certain parts of the rule are only included under certain configurations. And then we also have a configuration mechanism which allows you to select the configuration options and remove those parts you don't want. Then we have Steffen's plug for VTS morpher. Steffen, you want to say anything about this, about VTS morpher? Uh, no, that's fine. Uh, I think um, I think uh, Tony then also pointed to the to the VBE rule stuff, by the way, and I've put a link to your Eclipse Pedia article. All oh, right, yeah, it was also in the context of modularity. Yeah, and indeed. So VTS morpher is one way of making things modular by being able to yeah, specify some way of um, being a bit more. Well, you, can you can merge rules together in it, right? So you can write separate rules and combine them into, exactly. the, into the bigger rules. Yeah. Ah, yeah, and then also very practical tips. So reuse NN objects as much as possible, instantiating them in curves a significant performance hit. Yeah, that's a really good hint. So. You can reuse engine objects. There's really no point to create new engines all the time. There's also a hint. Ah, oh, yeah, this was especially yeah, this was exactly the uh, yeah the pointer to the work I was uh, yeah, alluding to. So about very deep-based rules, and uh, other languages also have some more composition-based approaches. Yeah, and this GTS morpher could be seen as a more composition-based approach compared to that annotation-based approach that we have in Henshin, indeed. And then also a link for that, right? Okay, any questions about these tasks? Otherwise, I would move on to the next parts. So there seem to be no questions coming in, so I will just move on. Okay, I will now walk you through a couple of more features of Henshin. So, so far, we have really seen the language core, and we have seen some really uh, most essential parts of Henshin, how to specify rules, how to execute them, but there's more to it. So some nice features of Henshin. So I have categorized them here in three broad categories about defining transformations, about executing them, and then also about analyzing transformations. The theme so far is support for defining transformations using this diagram editor. And we have also seen that you can execute rules either using a wizard or using an API. So what else do we have here? Let's first talk about rule generation. The problem here is that sometimes yeah, it can be tricky to define complex rules, especially if you have also some very complex underlying meta model. So this is the rule for deleting an association in UML. And UML associations come with properties, so they might link an association to an actor in a use case. And then the properties also have some literal integer and a literal unlimited literal um, object connected to them. This is complicated stuff, and it's really not, uh, at some point it gets a bit annoying if you have to do that manually. So we have some support for that. So some really simple, lightweight way of doing transformation by example, so to say. So it takes two input models, one original and one revised model. And then in this case here, we have the deletion and integration of an attribute. Uh, it's, it's actually refactoring here, right? So we have an attribute that you want to move from the uh, two subclasses here, so the class two and class one, to the super class. And then you give this as input to the generator, and then it creates something like this. So here in this case, it would create an own attribute edge, and it would also delete one of the properties. So yeah, this is nice because it allows you to use your UML editor that you're using anyways, and then you use this to define the model pairs, and then you have some way of using model comparison to find out which of these elements are the same. That of course, it's really simple, it's lightweight, it gives you the first draft of a rule. For example, it doesn't allow you to derive NUX, those you might need to specify manually, and you also might want to create some parameters and these things, so it's the initial draft of the rule. 
Okay, then we have G-Rough integration. What is this for? The issue here is that uh, yeah, the question of scalability. So scalability is a huge topic in MDE. There's also whole workshops only about scalability. And the typical observation is that EMF doesn't really scale well to large models. So when you have a big database, a huge database, like for example, the IMDB database, which at this point in time had some 900,000 movies, some 1 million, 407 million male actors, and almost 1 million actresses. Uh, so when you do this with normal uh, ways of doing replications, that doesn't really scale, it takes forever. So for such cases, we have some support of uh, connecting to GRAPH, which is a way of doing large scale data processing. And this allows you to really work well with input models that have millions of nodes and edges. What else do we have? So state space exploration. Once you have your rules, the nice thing is that we get the benefit from many things that have been formally defined, that there's some formal theory behind it. Uh, one example is the classical example of the dining philosopher's problem. So the question of do we, if we have this that's a setup that we have a couple of philosophers that sit around the table and they all have a left and a right fork, and they all use the same forks for eating, uh, is there ever a deadlock? And you can specify this behavior by saying there's a left rule, which is there for picking up the left fork. The picking up works by uh, creating this uh, edge where philosophers pick up a fork, and then also deleting this edge uh, that connects the table to the fork, and then doing the same thing for the right fork, here we create the right edge and delete the fork's edge between the philosopher and the fork and the table and the fork, respectively. And then we also have a release edge where we take an existing uh, situation like that. So a fork, a philosopher and a fork, and the philosopher has both forks in their hands. And then we release the forks and we instead put them back to the table. So we create these two forks edges. And then for setting up this uh, situation in the first place, we also have these create rules, similar to the grid rule we saw before. This is something you can execute a certain number of times to create a number of philosophers, plates, and forks. Another question is, this is a typical model checking question of, is there a dead organist example? Yeah, and Henshin uh, provides support for answering this question. So the way it works is, it's really not the most efficient way of the model checking because it assumes that you create the whole state space. So it's an enumeration of all states. Yeah, for some uh, improvement for performance, we abstract away from the order and also from certain attributes. And then we can uh, do model checking. There's different ways of doing that, different kinds of logics, different kinds of specification languages. Here we have support for state invariants, so we can check whether a certain invariant holds in all states. And we have qualitative and probabilistic model checking. So you can specify a pattern like this. So the number of forks for a certain table should always be uh, bigger than or at least zero. And then you can also click on a button which shows you whether that, whether that, whether that specification is uh, violated. And then it gives you the shortest path which has led to the situation. And here for the safe space, you see that here we have the deadlocks. So we have two deadlocks that typically happen when you know, every philosopher has the fork in the left hand, but not on the right hand, and the other way around. So then you can never make progress for these two deadlock states here. What else do we have? Conflicts and also dependencies. So you might have a situation like that, that you have some tool that automatically performs refactorings. So for example, it might be able to create parameters like that. So you have a method and add some parameters to this method. Or we might also want to move methods by saying we have two classes, a certain and target class, and now we want to delete the association between that class and the method and create an association between that class and that method. So that's how we move the method. And now we want to find out whether there are conflicts because there might be a reason for that. Like for example, when we do some automated factorings where we uh, create more complex refactoring, some smaller ones. Maybe you want to find out whether they have to be in a certain order. Or also you might do something with a search-based technique where you automatically apply many particular um, combinations of refactorings. You want to find out if there's a, 
If sometimes there is no point of doing them in a certain order because you cannot really do them. So this is something you can find out by doing a conflict analysis. So what could conflicts in this case look like? So assume we have this parameter addition rule and this move method rule again, and we have a particular input model, so a class file, a class printer, a class cooler. And now we want to execute that rule one two times. So that would always work out. We would never run, to, run into problems when we just create new parameters. So there won't be conflicts. The same as when we create a parameter and then move a method. No issues with that. The same also when we first move a method and then create a parameter. No problems with that. But there might be problems when we first move a method and then again move a method. So for example, we might first move the um, print method from file to printer, and then try to do also move method again from file to spooler. But that doesn't really work out because once we have moved the print method from the file to printer, it's not there anymore. So we have a conflict. Yeah, and Henshin provides you with some automated support for finding such conflicts. So it takes its input, a meta model, and a number of rules. Then we have a context menu entry, critical pairs. Then you can select a couple of options for doing that. And then it calculates you all of the results. So the results are shown like that. So you get this overview CPA result where you see certain conflicts. You can click on conflicts and then it will open the editors like that, where you see the left side, the right side, and the overlap of the conflict. So for example, the overlap could be the methods attribute or the reference here. And you see that yeah, this is really a part of the left model, the right model, and then the overlap is the common part of that. Okay, now let's talk about applications. So the Henshin is now a couple of years old. So the first paper about Henshin was published in 2009, I think. So that's some good 13 years. So and since then, lots of things have happened. Many people have been using Henshin because it's a very simple formalism. You can use it for many particular use cases. And I yeah, will walk through a couple of use cases that people have uh, that, that you, uh, people have used for applying Henshin too. So one situation is when you have models with uncertainty and variability. So you might have a situation where you have many possible designs, many design alternatives, and you are not yet too sure which of them you actually want to support in the end. But you still want to be able to, to transform the models. So maybe there are some things that you are actually sure about and you want to transform the model, but at the same time take into account the uh, uncertainty in the models. And yeah, the, so Henshin has been used to enable transformations like that. So you can specify your Henshin, transformations in Henshin and you can take as input your models with uncertainty. Then Henshin, then this extension here, this work of Familis et al. does some clever stuff based on uh, SMT solvers which allows you to specify the graph with uncertainty using Henshin. A very different situation about security. So when you build a system in a secure way, you typically have some security uh, measures installed and they, they are typically set up in a way that supports security based on your current knowledge about security. So your context knowledge about which kinds of attacks exist, which kinds of attacks and knowledge exist, and also what kinds of countermeasures you have. And this information you can make explicit in a so-called security ontology. And now this, the, the issue with security measures is that sometimes they become um, invalidated, right? For, for example, there might be a new attack that is discovered after some time, and you now want to re react to that change to the security knowledge. And Henshin has been used to describe so-called design model co-evolution rules that specify how a system should react to changes of security knowledge. So it could be, for example, to change the use of encryption algorithm. It could be to uh, make the access to certain resources a bit more conservative. So this has all been done in Henshin, and you know, this has been yeah, integrated in a bigger methodology called Secvolution. Another use case is a model versioning. So this is now when you want to find out how uh, 
models have changed over time. So you have two versions of a certain model for two revisions, where you have an old and a newer revisions, and when you want to find out what has been done. And the issue is that often you only get a very, very detailed overview of many changes. So the issue is that models, because they are typically defined using an abstract syntax, the kinds of changes you see, so when you do a diff, the result will not really be something you can easily work with because you are more interested in, in a higher level view. You, will, you want to understand the views on a higher level. So you, for example, you want to see whether generalization was created or whether an attribute was pulled up. So these higher level refactor rings, instead of seeing all the lower level changes of, yeah, there has been some edge that was created somewhere, some edge was deleted somewhere. So, and yeah, there has been an approach by Kera et al, who have used Henshin to specify these higher level rules and then also automatically detect whether particular higher level changes, whether particular refactorings have been performed in a model version history. Okay, and then there's also a whole lot of work that's been done in this area of search-based model optimization, where we have a given model and we want to optimize that model. So we want to change it. We want to make changes that lead to improvements towards a certain objective function. And there are many applications of this idea of search-based model optimization. Yeah, so there's a whole second part of the session where we want to talk about that scenario. Yeah, just to summarize that first part now, what we have seen so far was an introduction into Henshin, including the language, including a walkthrough the different uh, options you have for specifying and executing transformations. And we've also already seen some different applications where people have used Henshin to build some cool new things. And there was also an overview of Henshin's different features. Before we go to the second part about optimization, I wonder if there are any questions. What's the difference between preserved and required? Yeah, it's a very good question. That could seem a bit confusing at first because both, in some sense, require something. Right? And we have this example here. So when you want to create this account, it requires that we have a bank, a manager, and a client like that. The difference, so there's one example that makes this a bit clearer that we also have in the slide deck, I think. That is in that um, here we have it. Let's create a couple example. So this rule is about creating these couple nodes. So we want to find out whether we have two actors that together have played together in at least three movies. And if we had no if we had no way of distinguishing between preserve and require elements, so if we for example would label everything as preserve then we would create many unnecessary couple nodes because then we would not create couple nodes only for each pair of persons, but we would create couple nodes for every pair of persons together with any situation where they have played in at least three movies. And if they have played in, for example, 10 movies, then there's a big number of combinations you get from having movie one, movie two, movie three, and maybe movie one, movie two, movie four, movie one, two, and so on. So there's many combinations for which we would have to create a couple node. And this distinction between preserve and require allows us to capture the essential part of the matching. So the essential part here is really if you want to have that couple person, that couple of persons. And uh, the fact that they have played in at least three movies is also important, but it's not that we want to create a couple node for every situation where they have played in three movies. And this is what the require is for. So semantically, the way it works is that we will first find matches for this preserve part. This will find, find all possible pairs of persons. And then we will filter those matches by excluding those matches where the require pattern here is not fulfilled. So first we find all possible pairs and then we filter it so that we only keep those persons where those pairs of persons where there is no not at least but there is at least three movies where they play together.
Hedgen quo vadis. Oh, sorry, I will first I'll come back to the question about this example. Do you, fir you first do matching of present pairs and then check? Yeah, exactly that's what happens. Yeah, really good summary. Hedgen quo vadis. So the question of uh, where are we going with Hedgen? So we had a recent release which added a couple of new features. It's actually quite cool. So we had, a, so I can maybe open the release uh, announcement. So the best way of doing that would be to let me briefly unshare my screen. So I do a brief Google search here. Um, and there I have it already. So we had the release from June, which came with a couple of cool new features. So the first thing was that yeah, for some time, Henshin didn't really work well with Java from, from 15 onwards. Uh, it has been fixed, so at least we are now compatible with the most recent Java versions. Then we also have some new features for making the creation of uh, modules, so of rules and units, simpler, so a Copic API. We have some support of transforming OCL constraints to application conditions, which is nice if you want to have rules that satisfy, uh, that, that, that guarantee you that certain constraints are always fulfilled. And then finally, we also have some support for profiling the matching process because it turns out if you are lucky with Henshin, you get good behavior because of that good performance behavior because uh, for certain uh, replications, the matching is quite simple. But sometimes there's some yeah, questions of how to get a good search plan. And these things, yeah, we don't really have something that allows you to automatically generate a good search plan, but at least we have some profiling support now, which allows you to find out where in my matching process are the performance bottlenecks. Yeah, so I think there's now some work going on about further improving the performance process by automatically also generating some better search plans. And there's also ongoing work in this uh, area of how to deal with constraints. So can we both uh, check for a given uh, set of rules whether they uh, guarantee that uh, rules at least do not uh, break certain constraints or might even lead to improvements towards certain constraints so that you have an input model which does not satisfy the constraints and it gets better by applying the rules. So that's also a cool direction. And I wonder maybe somebody is in the chat and they are also currently working actively on Henshin or some uh, extensions or some um, kinds of uh, systems that build on Henshin would also be interested in that. we can also briefly go into the part about optimization. So it's the smaller of those two parts, but it's an interesting one. So the second part of this is really all about optimization, using engine in search-based model optimization. So first, some background. This is about different optimization problems in software engineering. So nowadays, there's a trend towards the so-called area of search-based software engineering which goes back to uh, lots of Mark Harmon's work, but this has been really a big thing and it's like lots of different approaches being published now for different use cases, such as architectural refactoring, about sprint planning, about component deployment. So all of these scenarios have been common that you have a goal you work towards to. In architectural refactoring, you might want to strive for having um, good cohesion and coupling. So you want to make sure that uh, things that belong together are in the same modules. In sprint planning, you want to make sure that you have a fair distribution of workload and that you might want to make the customers uh, most happy, they pay the most. And then in component deployment, you might want to respond to changes of workload quickly, and you might also want to avoid paying too much price, uh, too high price. So there's a question of finding an optimal solution among a vast number of candidates. So in the case of an architectural refactoring, you are interested in finding a good assignment of classes to packages. You want to maximize cohesion and minimize coupling. In the case of sprint planning, you go from assigning from work items that you want to assign to sprints. 
and you want to find solutions that maximize the number of items in the sprint and also maximize customer satisfaction. In component deployment, you might want to optimize the assignment of components to hosts. You want to minimize price and you might want to minimize overhead. So a couple of situations you can express as models and you have some notion of what is a good solution. Here we will go into a particular case, which is the class accessibility assignment case, also known as CIA. So it's really about the question of how can we create high quality object oriented models. And yeah, it's called class of accessibility assignment because the question is really, we are given with a particular problem where we want to decide where certain class operations attributes belong. So the input would be a set of operations and attributes, and we want to assign them to certain classes. What are some problems where CIA is important? For example, we might start with an application that was written in a procedural language, and we want to go object-oriented. So we want to find out what is a good set of classes to which we can assign our existing functions. Also, we might want to optimize a certain class diagram. So for example, we might have an existing object-oriented model, and we now want to refactor it to improve cohesion and coupling. And there's actually a computational engineering problem. So there's a really big search space because there's many different ways of assigning features like that to classes. So it's typically handled as an optimization problem. What could one instance of this problem look like? So here in this case, we start with a class model that contains a number of methods and a number of attributes. So you see that we have here in this case uh, the different methods of names such as add item, cut total, checkout, and so on. These are methods. And then we have attributes like items, name, price, and quantity. And now we want to create classes. So these methods and attributes should be spread out up among classes in a way that then optimizes cohesion and minimizes coupling. So one solution could look like this. So we have a new class my shop with items card, and we have classes card and item. And then the existing methods and attributes are now spread up among the different classes. And now there's a certain formula behind this. So I think the next slide shows that formula. Uh, how you calculate the quality of solutions. So the so-called CAA index, which uh, takes two input um, arguments, which are the cohesion ratio and the coupling ratio. And each of them does some calculations that look at the number of relations between uh, functions. So there are calls among functions, like you see it here. So checkout calls another function card total. And there's also data dependencies. So check out, for example, uses the attribute items. This formula really uh, takes a big sum over many different relationships that are there. And then in the end, we subtract the co coupling ratio from the cohesion ratio. And then we get values like that. So we might, for example, say that this example solution has a cohesion ratio of two and a coupling ratio of 444. And then this would be the overall and here is the index. And the objective here is to find solutions that optimize this CIA index. So we want to find models for which that CIA index is a large number. And for this, we use this idea of search based software engineering. So the problem is that, in principle, one way of doing this would be just to enum enumerate all possible solutions. In practice, we can only do this for very small models because it quickly explodes. There are just too many options of doing that. And then, um, yeah, of course, there are many different optimization problem types. There are also problem types where you can use some smart solvers that guarantee you also you will get some uh, actual optimal result, like the global maximum. Uh, so, for example, ILP is a kind of solver technique that does that. But it assumes that your um, objective functions have a certain form. Like, for example, it, it's only made up out of linear equations. And that's very restrictive. For example, this particular case here cannot really be, be expressed as consisting of linear equations. So we need to have something which is more flexible with supporting kind of arbitrary objective functions, like, for example, this one here. 
And this is really where search-based techniques kick in because they are super flexible with supporting different techniques. You basically just implement some function in a language like Java that tells you how good is my given solution. And that function could, for example, be the different formulas for calculating the CIA index. And then the idea is that we start out with some version of the model. It could, for example, be only the features you want to assign to classes. Then you have the steps of mutation, crossover, and selection, inspired by natural evolution. So you mutate things by changing some small details in solutions. You do crossover by combining two solutions in a new way. And you do selection based on these fitness criteria on this objective function that tells you how good the solution is. So in each of these iterations, you leave away the, the, the less performing ones compared to the better performing ones. And then at some point you are done. So you have some determination criterion, either a number of iterations, or you have some adaptive criterion that tells you if the solution didn't change over a certain time, and we stop and you end up with a good solution. Uh, there's a certain cost here, so we need to customize the search algorithm to the top of my hand. So we need to develop an encoding in a certain framework, and encoding can take substantial expertise to develop. That's really the motivation for doing what we call search-based model optimization. So typical search-based techniques require you to develop some low-level encoding, so some kind of uh, array of integers or booleans, and then have lots of calculations where you go from your high-level thing to those uh, vectors, but that's typically not really handy. So here in this case, we use models for describing solutions. So for example, we use the class models that we see here in this example directly. So we don't need any low-level encoding using some vectors, but we just use the model as it is in EMF. Then we have some standard manipulations, some, some ways of changing uh, our models in a well-defined way. For this, we can use model transformations, like for example, Henshin. So Henshin has this way of defining subtle changes to models in a really elegant way. So this is a really nice application for Henshin. And then in the end, we move the optimization knowledge from humans to tools. OK, so what do we need for that? The first thing we need is to have some description of what the solution actually look like, so some meta model for solutions, like for example, the class model meta model for CIA. Then we need to have some notion of constraints. So uh, what are constraints that solutions always have to fulfill? Like for example, in CIA, every feature has to be assigned to a class eventually. And then we have fitness functions. So what makes the solution good? And then we also have the question of how can solutions be derived? And that is that relies on encoded knowledge of optimization and it uses modeling technology, like in particular also transformation technology like Henshin for changing solutions. Okay, and now we have one particular tool that uses Henshin for solving optimization problems. And the tool is called MD Optimizer. So MD Optimizer is a tool that addresses multi-objective optimization. So you can have an arbitrary number of optimization functions, but only one. It works directly over models. So instead of having some low-level encoding, we really use the models as a representation of the problem. It comes with a specification language for allowing you to specify your search problem and also a kernel for executing the search. Intention is used in particular for specifying evolutionary operators, in particular mutation. So more technically, MD Optimizer relies on online frameworks, in particular MOA. This is a standard framework in search-based software engineering. So more generally in genetic algorithms, so it comes with different algorithms which allow you to do the search. And it also relies on Henshin for specifying mutation operators. And I think this idea has been explored in early stages to also define crossover in Henshin. Uh, but uh, most of the published work so far is about the mutation operator. And then you have some global files, so the mdmop file that specifies the whole specification, including the, those meta models, the constraints and theta functions, but also those technology aspects of uh, yeah, what mutation operators we use. So the central information about everything about the problem is in that file. 
Yeah, so what do we have in that file? So we have a path, we specify the meta model, we specify the input model, the objective, the objectives want to say, so this could also be several ones because it's multi-objective. Then also constraints. So for example, here the constraints that there should not be any classless features. And then also a number of mutation rules. And then we also have an optimization provider, which is the underlying library we use. We, then we have a couple of configuration options like the used algorithm. So a popular one is NGA, NSGA2, but there's also different other ones. We can also decide whether we want to support either only one or both types of variation, so mutation and crossover. Here in this case, only mutation. And then we have certain parameters, like for example, number of evolution, the population size, and also the number of batches. So batches is really number of runs. Maybe you only want to run it once. Maybe you want to run it a higher number of times. For CAA, um, this goes back to one solution that was submitted to the transformation tool contest. So at some point, CIA has been the subject of TTC, and there was a solution based on the optimizer that used these rules here. So we have four rules. One of them is responsible for assigning features to classes. So you see we create this edge between feature and class when we say this is divided by. We have a rule for creating new classes. So this, this new class would always encapsulate some new feature, which was previously not yet encapsulated. We have a rule for moving features. So maybe the feature is currently not stored in the most optimal class, so we can move it. And we also want to delete empty classes because after we have done lots of moving, maybe there are some classes which don't have any features left, and then we want to delete those. And so we have a deletion rule that deletes classes that are not uh, still encapsulating some features. So if you listen very closely at the beginning of this talk, I also mentioned that we have these dangling edges. So if this edge would exist anyways, um, then we could not use, delete the class. So in that sense, it's a bit of syntactic sugar here that we also specify for bit pattern here, because in principle, we cannot delete classes if they are connected to any features. Then the objective function here in this case, there is a class in the code called maximize CIA that defines how the fitness is calculated and in the end returns it. So it's a double value. And then about constraints, that's actually a bit of a special thing here. So yeah, here it's still the version where we see it's like, a, um, so we don't see the return time directly, but in the end it turns out that even though it's a constraint, so constraint normally is a pass fail thing, right? Either your uh, model satisfies the constraint or not. Like for example, either we have no classes features, so even either we have a, a feature that has no class associated to it or not, so it's a, it should be Boolean. But actually it's also useful to know how badly a particular constraint is violated. It could be informative for comparing two solutions where we know that yeah, they are both broken, both of them are incorrect, but one of them at least is a bit less badly broken. So this is why we here, instead of returning a, a Boolean, we return a fitness value actually also. Yeah, so you can also say that this fitness value here specifies how far your solution is away from fulfilling the constraint. Yeah, and then you have also these parameters here which are about how deeply you search. So obviously, as a trade-off here, yes, if you want to have quick results, you would choose long values for the parameters, so the number of evolution, population size, uh, you get results quicker, but the effect is not, could be not as high, so you might get suboptimal solutions. Yeah, this is something I might skip for time reasons, so of course you can write for yourself how to do the running in, in, in the optimizer. Now, this is just some final thought that was also interesting. So how do you design good mutation operators? So the set is time consuming. And to get good results quite quickly, you might want to think about how do I get good mutation operators? So it turns out that there's a way of defining the mutation operator which is better than others. So the question there for this is, what are desirable structures from the perspective of the objective function, how to create them? And the answer for this is 
Okay, the answer is really you need to um, move class. You will need to move features to other classes where there are some features that already rely on that particular feature. So you improve cohesion by having some smart rules that take that into account. Okay, to sum up now in the second part of this um, training session, we saw how Engine is used in the Optimizer, and we saw also how it's applied to a particular case CIA.